but the Fed is doing a lot more than just cutting interest rates, a lot more. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me about the Fed, and I remember actually commenting on this and not knowing what the answer was, but months ago, the Fed started intervening into the repo markets, into the repurchase markets. And repurchase mm-hmm. markets are these very short-term markets where people, where companies, not individuals, but companies and um, basically put up treasuries as collateral. This goes to the liquidity issue that Rob was talking about. Put up, they have to say, so let's say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a corporation and I've got a bunch of treasuries. I've got a bunch of bonds in my, in my portfolio, in, in my vault or whatever. Right? And, but I need cash. I, I don't want the treasuries. I need cash. So what I can do is I can go into the market. It's called the repo market. And I can lend my treasury to another party and they give me the cash. And then I can use that cash to pay taxes, to pay payroll, to pay suppliers, to do whatever things I need for the cash. And I remember in the fall, there was this day. So the interest rates in this market are very, very low because you've got collateral, which is a government bond. And usually get paid back less than two weeks. It could be a day. It could be overnight. It could be a week. It could be two weeks. So it's a very short-term loan, mm-hmm. highly collateralized. And yet, on a day, I, I can't remember the month, but, but in the fall, interest rates went to 10%. Mm-hmm. And the Fed immediately intervened with like $50 billion and started pouring money, started participating. So basically, it was the one accepting the treasury and giving out the money, right? And lending out the money. And right now, by the way, it's doing it at the tune of $1.5 trillion, right? It's basic supply and liquidity of $1.5 trillion. Now, this isn't just money going into the economy because they get it back. But if they keep doing this, it is a $1.5 new trillion dollars in the economy. Now, so this is in the fall. And I remember saying to people in the fall, this has to be a signal that something is crazy in the market. And my speculation at the time was that certain banks were trying to borrow in the overnight market and other banks didn't want to give the money because they were afraid they would default. And I think the primary bank at the time that was suspect was Deutsche Bank, uh, European banks, so a disaster, have been a disaster really since 2008, but certainly since the Greek financial crisis. And people just didn't want to lend money to Deutsche Bank, so they were driving interest rates way up. Uh, and you can't, you can't always tell who your counterparty is, so it's hard to unwind these. Anyway, the Fed intervened, but it was already suspect because why does it need to intervene in a, you know, banks have a lot of liquidity on the books, right? On the books, there's a lot of liquidity. So why is the Fed intervening? And, and I think that was the first indication, not of coronavirus, but something was going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and that, and now we're seeing, of course, all of that on steroids where mm-hmm. the, the, the Fed is basically committed to providing liquidity in every sector of the economy. And, and there are people arguing that the Fed should be allowed now to buy corporate bonds, stocks, stocks yeah. uh, everything to provide liquidity to every market. That would be interesting to say the least, but that would be an unmitigated disaster if they do that long-term, short-term, it will feel great. Long-term it will be unmitigated disaster. But so far they, they just started buying uh, municipal bonds. That's the latest that they're buying. So they're buying now treasuries, U.S. bonds, in other words, government bonds, they're buying uh, mortgage-backed securities, and they're buying more, um, munis, municipality. And notice what that does. That lowers the cost of borrowing for city governments who probably can't afford to run their programs. And the Fed, basically, we're doing a massive bailout implicitly of all these cities and counties that didn't plan for, for something like this. Yeah, I mean, I think the muni bond market crashed by the most since 1981 is the uh, headline I saw. Um, but on top of that, a few programs you left out, you're on. Yep. Uh, money market funds, they yep. announced a program to support money market funds. Um, and then also commercial paper to buy commercial paper to support. So that's Tell short term. What paper is. What's that? Tell us what commercial paper is. Oh, yeah. Commercial paper is basically short term loans to corporations. So it can be from 30 to 90 days, typically. Um, and so corporations would issue this to get short-term loans to, you know, pay for inventory that they're going to sell within 30 to 90 days, maybe, uh, you know, meet bills that are, are you know, coming due sooner than they get the, re- the revenues for them and so on. Um, but, you know, here's one thing, though, is when you have ultra-low short-term interest rates and longer-term rates are higher, so if, if short-term rates are zero and long-term rates are 3 or 4%, you know, maybe a lot of corporations are going to issue short-term paper to build a factory or do some kind of long-term investment because 
you can save yourself a lot of money that way. So as a result, they get in this illiquid position where all of a sudden they can't borrow the money they need anymore. They, you want to keep rolling over these short-term commercial paper loans to fund their long-term investments. All of a sudden they can't, they don't have the money to pay them back. The market starts to collapse and then the Fed to the rescue. Okay, so one of the parallels then with 2008, so 2008, it was the Fed started doing things that um, people never imagined that the Fed would do. And so you're saying now in this one, they're doing even more new things that they've never done before uh, in, in the face of this. It, the, the, yeah. One of the important yeah. differences is in 2008, some people objected. There were voices to say, wait, wait a minute. These are youth, you know, you don't know. Nobody's objecting now. There's yeah. no voices out there saying, no, they should sit it out. They should, or they should do something different. Everybody basically is on this train of the only hope we have is that the Fed does more liquidity. More, do more, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so we, again, dulled our senses. There's a real sense, and this is, I guess, a, 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 an epistemological point. I mean, there's a real sense in which it, our scope of thinking keeps shrinking every crisis, and people become more complacent, more tuned with intervention and in the mixed economy and authoritarianism. It's the point you made about Trump's election. It's, it's, it, 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 just, it just constantly reinforces this, this dulling of the brain, of dulling of the mind. Well, I mean, I think one sense dulling of the mind is that nothing bad has happened so far. So, you know, back in 2008, people were complaining because it's okay, you're doing these radical monetary uh, actions and policies which you know, seem pretty extreme and have to have bad consequences. But 10, 12 years later, there's, we still have not seen the bad consequences, or at least they've been under the surface and they're starting to come to light now. Uh, but everybody thinks, oh, it did great. It saved us in 2008. It caused the economy to recover and we had an amazing economy and stock market for the last 10 years. So it worked. Now, so they don't, uh, they don't uh, connect what's happening now to the fact that that's the unwinding of all the things the Fed was doing before. So, so the first thing the Fed, the first thing the Fed has done is they've reactivated all the programs that they did uh, initiate in 2008. So, like the money market fund was something they did in 2008. Uh, the the quantitative easing is something that they started in 2008, and so on. Um, so, but now they are doing new stuff, like the muni bond stuff is something new. Um, but I think you're right. All the voices are now pushing them to do more. So, you know, bail out muni bonds now, you know, backstop, uh, you know, treasury repos and so on. And, uh, so, uh, but, you know, again, because they think it works, you know, another thing is people thought it would cause inflation. Even the fed thought it would cause inflation, or at least there was a good chance it would. In fact, they've been trying to cause inflation for the last 10 years and failing and not sure why they're failing. Um, and here we mean uh, price inflation. We mean price, price inflation. inflation. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Price inflation. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, people worried about that in 2008. That didn't happen for some reason, which I don't understand, and the Fed doesn't understand, even. Um, so it seems like it doesn't cause any bad. Th and same with deficit financing. So yeah. you know, the government can can borrow. You know, 30-year bonds got as low as 0.7 percent yield last week. Mm -hmm. Now they've jumped back up to 1.7 percent for 30 years, but I mean that's just an astonishingly low yield for 30 years. Um, so yeah, you know, we're already running trillion-dollar deficits. Uh, U.S. budget deficit was already a trillion dollars going into this, um, and now you know they're going to be doing. I think I think the headline a couple hours ago said the stimulus package is now up to two trillion. The Congress is voting on. Well, um, the, the British did the equivalent of three trillion, and the da the Dutch in Denmark they've just done two and a, or the equivalent in the U.S. What would be two and a half trillion? Okay, yeah, it's incredible. The equivalent is the size of GDP. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so they think they can borrow as much as they want and yields don't go up and inflation isn't going up and so on. So they think they can do all these things and there will be no bad consequences and they think it will help. So, I mean, that's the kind of dulling of the senses. So it will cause bad things down the road, but nobody understands that or connects with that. So And, and it already has, right? So, so yeah. while there was no inflation and there were no crashes and the economy seemed to be doing okay, the economy only did okay, right? Yeah. So... Um, from 2009 on, the economy has grown, including under the greatest economy in all of human history, Trump. It only grew at around 2%, which is pathetic, truly pathetic in terms of economic growth. I think I, I saw the statistics once. If the United States had grown between, I don't know, 1890 and, and 1980, one percentage less per year during that period, we today would be poorer than Mexico. Okay. So one percentage compounded is huge. So the fact that we only grew at 2% versus 3% historical growth, or 4% or 5% potential 
growth. Who knows? Maybe it's six or seven percent. I don't know what the upside potential is of a truly free market. That is the real cost. You know, even without this crisis, the cost is the fact that there was no growth, and then that there was probably more growth in areas where we didn't really need it. Right. And no growth, maybe for example, in hospital beds in areas where we did need it. Because, you know, I don't know if one of the reasons we don't have hospital beds is because of regulation and because of cost cutting dictated by Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe private hospitals, like pretty bet, would have more beds. So all of that is unseen. This goes back to economics in one lesson by Hazlitt. It's the unseen that is important in economics. And yet nobody wants to see the unseen. Nobody yeah. makes the effort. Yeah. And I mean, just, I don't know if this gets too far away from where you want to go, Ankar, but uh, just to throw this on the pile too, in terms of consequences, the last 10 years, it's been brutal for anybody on a fixed income. Yep. So mm -hmm. with 0% interest rates, and you can't afford to take a lot of risk because you're 80 years old. So you can't put all your money in the stock market and you know, hope that it's higher 20 years from now. Um, you need a fixed income that you can count on that's low risk, but you can't get that because interest rates are so low. Um, so that's been brutal for people trying to live on a fixed income and not take undue risks. Um, it's been hard for people who are saving for retirement if you can't get decent yields on bonds. So they have to put all their money in the stock market instead and hope for the best. Now that's crashing and who knows where that's going to go to. Right on the point where the baby boomers are reaching peak retirement age. Um, and and you know, pension funds and insurance funds have been suffering for the last 10 years because they build in a certain assumption about what kind of yield they're going to get on bonds, which has not been anywhere close to being realized. So insurance funds are you know, finding their portfolios are in rough shape. Pension funds are way underfunded. Um, and now they're going to be even more underfunded with the stock market 30% lower. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it, you know, one, one thing that I saw about a year or two ago, the uh, Illinois, which is one of the worst in terms of pension, pension underfunding, the public pension, uh, the treasurer issued something like $10 billion of bonds municipal bonds so that she could take that money and put it into the pension fund to put it in stocks because she could issue bonds at a few percent and then stocks, you know, would make 10 or 20% a year. Um, so that was her plan for, you know, you know, getting the pension fund back on a sound footing. And I thought, okay, that's going to be a disaster, of course. And here we are. So now it's going to be, you know, the Illinois pension funds can be even worse off than it was. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. And to reinforce what you just said, it's not just the Illinois pension fund. I'm sure a lot of 80 year olds, seeing yields and bonds so low, seeing what was happening in the stock market, shifted their portfolios yep. into stocks. Absolutely. I know, I know that uh, pension plans, insurance companies, endowments, all these went way more into stocks than they should have. Yeah. Because there was no yield. That, so this is called yield chasing. And you see that in financial markets all the time. People are willing to buy ridiculous stuff just to get a little bit more yield. And, and take on huge risk. And of course, the consequence of that is what we're experiencing right now. A lot of these people are going to be wiped out. And many of these pension plans and insurance companies were already underfunded before this. Now are going to be hopelessly underfunded. Um, and, um, you know, who knows where that, where that leaves us uh, in the short run and in the long run. Yeah, and especially with the largest segment of the United States population hitting retirement age right now. So. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, Please take this opportunity. Go to youronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, youronbrookshow, and, um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...